welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Kana Salbinas, Makalua, the main team, Mega Bears fan. With guest co hosts, Josh127, Bill did homework. Well, I mean, when I'm at work and there's not a lot going on, I'll post on the forum sometimes. So. I saw some one of your comments, but then it was too late that I saw what your avatar looked like, so... No dropped frames, so I'm going to call that good. You're going to call it good? I'm going to call it good. Let's go. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Polycast Episode 334. Title goes here. I think we can come up with a better title than that, guys. I don't know. I am your guest host today, Josh127, and I am joined by some of your regular hosts right now. Canis Albinus. Why are you reading the the, the secret inside baseball stuff? <laughs> the me and team. I'll show you, Yala. Mega Bear Sam. Also not good at thinking of titles. And perhaps eventually Makalua. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the privacy policy and EULA problem with Civilization 6 and 2K in general, and how it was being review bombed. That topic was placed in the last episode, what, 333, because there was no space in 332. But we now have some follow-up from Dave Henkel, who's the community manager at 2K for Civilization. And basically, he says exactly what we defined it said. They take personal information, such as email and birth date, when you sign up for a 2K account, which is not required to play the game. And if you are playing online services, that will be required. I.e., if you're going to be using their servers to do stuff, they need to know who you are. Civilizations... So does that include multiplayer? Well, multiplayer is through Steam. Yeah, so you don't even need it for multiplayer. Right. right. The only reason I signed up for a 2K account was so I could get that Settler Cat skin. It also says Never that Civ- <laughs> Civilization Six also takes telemetry, gameplay, action stuff for session time, start stops, system information that would be useful for debugging problems and that kind of thing so basically it's exactly what we assumed it was based on what we were told by that reddit thread a month ago there's nothing that they're actually doing that they're taking for any particular reason other than because they need to to do what you're asking them to do now about red shell that was removed in july because it was correctly or incorrectly claimed to be a spyware after it was removed all of the red shell information was destroyed the servers were no longer allowed to keep collecting collecting data for even the versions that did not have it removed, i.e. if you didn't update your game. So it looks a lot like we're not having to worry too much about it because they've done pretty much everything we assumed that a good company would do-ish. And now they're not doing anything that any other video game company is not doing. Right. If you no. are playing a modern video game, from a mod- especially from a modern large publisher, they are also doing all of this stuff as well. Most but other companies like, are collecting your data in the same way, too. Yeah. Some of them are being much more egregious, such as the Epic Games star yeah hey everybody and you're not gonna awesome. notice when we data mine your steam save are you <laughs> <And honestly, laughs> that's one way to do it might be doing some of these things too so yeah well we know that they do a lot of stuff but none of it has so far been a problem so i don't know i feel like trust steam in general but it's whatever i feel like steam has way more to lose in something like that than a company like 2k would because steam doesn't even make games anymore I mean, they they have Dota and they have Counter-Strike, and neither of those are particularly loved outside of their own community, so... Yeah, although Dota's pretty big, so it's not nothing for sure. The big kerfuffle in the comments was, this guy, Escago Bias, 255, he's like, well, I can't get it to work even though I made all the requirements... And it's available for my graphics card, and it didn't work. And then he's complaining about how it's not work. And this is Civ 4, which I can't understand why that wouldn't work in a modern environment. But I don't either. I've played it somewhat recently. I have alive, too. I have. Yeah. I tried it once, and then I lost, and oh. said I'm not oh. playing this anymore. But <laughs> unless Civ 4 is having trouble recognizing modern graphics cards as an actual graphics card, Mackie. Hey, we, we have a Mackie. Do it. Hey, hey, Mackie. Could be, but. 
I, I played it uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I was having no problems whatsoever. What I suspect yeah. his problem was is he doesn't have DirectX 9. That could be. Because nothing else runs DirectX 9 frequently anymore. So. But, but like, if you're going to put that on. If you're going to play an older game, you got you got to consider those things. Yeah, an older game will probably work on your computer if you do the right stuff. I mean, get too old and maybe not. But, you know, you got to just sit and look into it. Going on the, the forums and complaining, nobody's going to care if you can't can't get into Civ 4. The developers are on Civ 6. That's what they're thinking about. Well, and you'd think that the Civ 4, if it is DirectX, would try to download and install that. So unless it's, like, not available from those servers anymore. Yeah. And go yeah, ask. If you're, like, trying to play Warlords 2 or something, you're going to have to yeah. <laughs> you have to go back a bit. Might have to get the DOS box. Ask on the forums instead of in the comments of an EULA and privacy clarity thread. <laughs> Yeah. If you if you really want an answer, or if you, if you just want to complain, then put it in the EULA and privacy clarity thread. Uh, even that's probably not the most visible th- option you could pick if you just want to complain and have people see it. <laughs> well, well, I just said if you just want to complain, I didn't say you want to see have people uh, see true. it. <laughs> well, we also don't know where else this has been posted, so that's true. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> just, you copy paste every <laughs> single forum topic on Steam is yes. I can't play Civ Four because of my <laughs> graphics card. <laughs> there we go. Bump, 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 bump. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's true. We might roll that out. Now we're going to move on to a different kind of security. Uh, This one by Hike or... Is that a Q? It looks like a Q. I think it's a G. Q. Oh, then Haig. Okay. Let me see. The, the underline yeah, there is, he says, I feel like walls make cities too strong to conquer without proper siege engines or artillery, which makes it hard for AI empires to do. Granted, I've seen some improvements in, go- in Gathering Storm, but I'd like to tone down walls or give AI attack city attack bonuses from Emperor onwards. Not a lot of people like this uh, post, but I am arguing on his side. Walls are did not need to be buffed in Gathering Storm. I would like to see at least some attention given to positioning of units beyond what's happening right now. And yeah, this since the Defender so already has a large advantage in any combat, if you're talking about the AI, I mean, AI sucks, it throws away its units, fine, but that's not going to change no matter what you do with walls. But Defender has a huge advantage in Civ 6 in terms of vision, in terms of unit positioning freedom, and in terms of fortification bonuses for units to inflict zone of control on most of the enemy unit types you can defeat larger attacking forces with less investment by a significant margin and on top of all that you can stack city shots and encampment shots with ranged units inside that are very difficult to beat even if you have stuff that can ignore zone of control so I don't know, man. I, I don't think that the walls needed to be made stronger relative to their cost in the game. But that's just me. I do agree, but I also think that perhaps the larger problem might, for medieval walls in particular, might be that there aren't any medieval infantry or siege units in the upgrade path. There's no long sword or maceman or whatever or a trebuchet that you could actually build in order to take down those walls more quickly. You're stuck with the classical units or, God forbid, pikemen. I wouldn't even want to try to use pikemen in that capacity. Even with a great general, it'd be a little rough. Yeah, so if you had units on the tech tree at the same time that walls were available and you didn't have to wait until getting bombards and musketmen, then those medieval walls, at least, would not be as overpowered as they maybe are. Yeah. Maybe city strength shouldn't scale with which units you've built. What would you scale it on? But that's true. That is an odd thing. Well, I, I just kind of get confused when I'm fighting a civ and then their city strength goes up by 20 because they built a caravel. <laughs> that just doesn't seem right. Well, it's particularly strange with naval units. And it's an odd mechanic in general. But yeah, with naval units, it's even weirder. The big thing I noticed on this, though, too, was, and I do agree with you guys about the, what you're saying about the walls, but in this post, it's about making it hard for the AI empires to do. And one thing I don't think is changing walls walls to make an AI more competent is not a good answer. If the problem that the post is supposed to be about is the AI's incompetence to take cities, that needs to be fixed in other ways. That needs AI improvements, right. not, the wall, problem, not wall changes. The problem isn't with the wall. It's with the AI not being able to handle them correctly. And like I said before, with there not being any units available at that time period that can actually you know, competently take down walls. Thank yeah, you. that does suck that the units intended to counter city walls, siege units, do not actually do so because they can just shoot them and kill them yeah. i mean a, a catapult against medieval walls is that a one-shot kill or it probably takes you down to something like 20 or 30 hit points where like you cannot reasonably get a shot off before your unit dies 
So unless you just bring like five of them and assume that half of them are going to be cannon fodder, you just can't use them. You have to use a general and have relatively oh, yeah. flat terrain because then you can fire them first. That's against... kind of dicey. If you actually get enough promotions to get them three range, they're nice, but that takes ages. It's just yeah. impractical unless you're running like marathon or something and grinding XP. Right. Well, one of the things that I do is against the AI in particular is if you've just got one unit that has already taken damage, you know, so you just get like a swordsman or someone and let him take a hit and then just fortify heal him in front of the city, the AI will target the unit with the least hit yeah. points and then it will ignore your siege units and you know archers or crossbows or whatever that are dwindling down its wall strength yeah i've done that to draw fire on a useless unit or, or one that i'm willing to give up now in the ai's defense prioritizing a melee unit actually can be good strategy because if you take out all the melee units they cannot actually take the city with an archer or a catapult so like there is some validity to that the problem is that a lot of times they'll just keep shooting that unit even though they're not actually ever going to kill it because it's healed and fortified and all that. It's hard to beat a human as an AI if you don't have a neural network. Why, a... why is it, though, that as we're taking down the walls, we're not getting like more damage through them? Because, I mean, a catapult, if you th think about it in what it did, it didn't take down a wall entirely, and then you can move in on it. It creates holes in the wall, and then people can charge through. Even so, that was pretty rare historically. Well, yes. Yeah, three I cannon agree. siege to bring down walls is really uncommon. And the most common way for cities to get taken was for them to be besieged. But that's not yeah. even a thing in the game. Like, you can prevent the city healing, but you'll never take a city by just surrounding it and waiting. Total war. But that's a big yeah. part of why why taking a city is so bad right now is that you have to kind of wait through that or bring the right tools. I mean, that's another tactical move, though, So, which I like. It's kind of one of those things of, I don't know, walls don't usually make for good games. Yeah. And just from a game perspective, pure game perspective, I don't like the, like, I feel like your, your army being out of position to be really punitive relative to having it properly positioned. Like that is an ideal part of the design in my mind, that that should matter a lot. Overbuffed walls really cut into that because it takes ages to get through them. Yeah, I think part of the reason why pillaging has been buffed is to compensate for that lack of importance. Because uh, if, if you get five units in your land that you weren't expecting and they pillage your tiles, whoever just pillaged your tiles got a lot of stuff. That's true. I would like it to be more of a threat to the defender, though, and perhaps less egregious in terms of how much stuff it's giving the attacker. Because that, that's, like, ridiculous. I don't know. It said it was supposed to be on the order of about a tenth of attack, so... I know, but the way it's balanced right now is pretty iffy. I'm <laughs> just saying. Maybe I'm just lazy and I like it, but... I think it's okay. I mean, yeah, it's it's certainly good for, like, tech pacing and stuff, but, like, you can make your entire economy on this, and, like, <laughs> it's competitive with proper infrastructure to just pillage a target repeatedly. I think oh, with that... the old warmonger mechanics, that, that was really good, because it meant that you could actually do something in a war that would be meaningful without having to take cities and get a lot of warmonger penalties. But now Ooh. that they've switched to grievances, that is a little bit moot. I'm just picturing in a multiplayer game where you two people just repeatedly pillage and repair stuff. But I think the other intent here is that if you're pillaging their territory and they don't want you to be getting all those bonuses, and perhaps the idea is that they should then take their units to meet you out in the field instead of just hunkering down in their cities. Yeah, and even in this scenario, though, the city was, can still shoot you. So if you have like at least some units present, yeah. you can oppose this. City density, I feel, is, is way too high in general, so there really is no battling in the field in Civ Six, and it was the same in Civ Five, but now it's even worse because of encampment over, uh, districts overlapping with cities as well. The real problem yeah. is that there aren't enough tiles on the map. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Not enough yeah. tiles. And because of that, they make the city space. range three. Do you remember when city range was two in Civ Five? Oh my god! I don't think it ever was three two city distance in Civ Five, was it? It was. I can't believe uh, that. But then again, it's been it was either nine beta years. or early vanilla. I don't remember which, but there was one point where that was a thing. It was nine years ago, so I could be forgetting. It got changed pretty quickly because it's one of many ICS measures. They're anti-ICS measures. Because, like, early vanilla Sify was just pure ICS. Yeah. They didn't have yeah. the penalties in place to disincentivize that. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so unbelievably slow. Yes. Although Civ 6 is pretty slow, too. But, yeah, Civ 5 was pretty bad in vanilla in that way. I actually don't have any speed problems with Civ 6, so I don't know what but... No, I'm thinking more just, like, in how it plays rather than, like, IBT and such. Although Civ 4 was faster IBT as well. I had to think for a minute, what the heck does he mean by IBT in between turns? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forget that, like, not everybody is using the 
common forum where you're on all the time for when you're like doing strategy discussion. Well, apparently here it's not common. No, I mean like in the strategy and tip stuff and whatnot. Yeah. Just because like there's a lot of things that can only happen between turns. So that game became something you see with a fair amount. Some of the things considered or suggested in this thread, maybe we should make it so that you can put siege units on mountains next to cities so that they have a way to kind of avoid being destroyed instantly. I still kind of like an idea that I've proposed a while ago, which would be that instead of siege units being units that you actually build and move around, there's something that military engineers construct on the spot, kind of like as an improvement. And then you tear them down when you're done. I really like that idea. You get a gold star. But then how do we shred people with cannons later? I do like the idea, though. You still get the mobile cannons. It's just that the early units that were the kind that were made from wood and things like that and built on site, those you're going to have to build. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure whether whether the cannons and artillery would be required by an engineer, but that's something I hadn't decided. But yeah, definitely catapults and trebuchets would be something that would be built on the spot by a military engineer and then torn down when you were done. I feel like you could combine that that with the other stuff. That sounds a lot like the old setup, though. That that just sounds like the Civ Five setup, where you're you're gonna go there, you're gonna spend a turn to set it up. That was what they were doing. The, I, I think what you're saying though is that instead of moving around, I, I guess what we would see, you'd be moving around a military engineer. So right. instead of that, you're basically just going to give the artillery a bigger range of movement. They yeah, already can't make it a move. support unit. They already can't yeah. attack if they've already moved in Civ Six. So mm-hmm. well, but also I was thinking the siege weapon would actually not be a unit. It would be like an improvement on the map or something like that. So it's not something city would be able to actually attack. Oh, okay. So it, it wouldn't have hit points. You'd have to send a unit out to pillage it if you wanted to get rid of it. Or maybe just make it a support unit. Yeah, I think the support unit and yeah, then that could work it, too. it sets up an artillery is the way to go. And then it can be protected by melee, which would be sensible. And it could only be used if somebody's there with it to use it. Yeah. yeah. yeah just yeah. make the engineer use it. But if it's unprotected, then you get screwed because it's a support unit. Oh, wait a minute. We just recreated the battering ram. <laughs> <laughs> well, this thing can shoot, though, is an yes. important difference. Yes, it adds the ability to fire. But you don't need Maybe to fire if you've got a battering ram. Yeah, but being able to shoot is an advantage. I guess. Now you can attack with more than just your melee units if you're willing to build the engineer. And you can do both. Yeah. And the engineer's a little bit more useful. Yeah, yeah. Some oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> but railroads, come on. Engineer is too useful useful. insert terrible segue here. We have another post from Bonafide 11 on the Symphonatics forums titled Neglected Features and Bonafide's post is basically just that tourism doesn't really do anything and appeal doesn't really do anything which uh, both of which are pretty true and then asking what other features do we wish would be more involved with the actual gameplay. So yeah, tourism and appeal are pretty much just late game features that are completely irrelevant up until you start going for a cold your victory most of and, the time uh, that is some a little civs, unfortunate some civs get a good big bonus from that but australia i think a bigger problem is that i think just the great work system in Civ 6 is a regression from Civ 5, because in Civ 5, they had a lot more options for, like, theming your museums and stuff like that. So a lot earlier in the game, you actually would start theming your museums. And so thinking about tourism and, you know, culture would, is something that you would start doing earlier. Whereas in Civ 6, like, theming a museum is so obnoxiously difficult that a lot of times it's not even worth trying to do, because there's so many different types of great works, and, like, you need to have a specific type, and they have to all be from different people, and from the same era. They don't have to be from the same era. Don't they? Pretty No. Or different eras. Is that a Civ 5 thing, maybe? Well, in Uh, Civ 5, there were things that had to be same era, same civilization, or same author, and then there were some that had to be different, and then there were some that had to be different, different, different. Yeah. Right. Whereas I'm pretty sure in in Civ Civ 6, you can theme it. I I did manage to theme one such that it was three ancient barbarian artifacts, and that was themed. But it has to be the same type of art, not the same artist will do it for museums at least yeah something like that and it's it's really difficult to do because there's just so many different types of great works and it's hard to collect all of them it's it's easier to do with archaeological artifacts which means that i basically never even bother building art museums anymore i just build the what is it the natural history museums or the archaeology museums or whatever they're called because it's a lot part of it is that when you dig up the artifact you can usually pick between one of two different sieves that the artifact will come from so you actually have some freedom 
in and control over what you end up getting, which makes it a little bit easier to theme those. But like the arts, like, yeah, good luck getting three sculptures from three different artists. I think there are exactly three different artists in the game who create sculptures. So you would have to nice. get one from all of them. And then you'd have to micro them into the same buildings or do you still have yeah. to do that? Yeah, you'd have to. Yeah, put... that, that kind of needs an automation feature there because you're going to go through all this stuff to get all the right stuff. And then you're going to have to sit around and micro it. Do people really want to spend that time? And then there's the annoying restrictions where, like, you can't move an artifact or great work. After, for X number of turns. Yeah, yeah for X I number of turns. That. And then even mm -hmm. then, you try, even if you can move it, you can't put it into a different building until that building has completely filled its slots. And then you swap them, I think, is also another restriction. It's not very well explained, and it's just so tedious and annoying and cumbersome. Yeah, it feels like there was some busy work built in for moving the things around, whereas in previous I could just swap those around at will and try and, you know, max out my benefits. The problem right. is, the problem is in this exactly. case, yeah. archaeologists are based on the city they come from, which means if your archaeologist still exists, you can't put a different artifact in the museum because that archaeologist still has slots that it needs a place to put stuff. Well, right. that's just silly. Well, well it's, it's also, is... it's not really silly. It's just badly implemented. All it means is that, oh, my archaeologist can pick up three artifacts, but I just traded for two artifacts from some other sieve. Well, now my archaeologist cannot dig up an, archaeolog an archaeological object, but it's still on the map costing you money. What are you going to do? Because you can't, I, do, think... I don't think you can disband it if it's already used one of its charges, can you? I think you can. But Maybe also, not. there's I nothing, I, I don't recall anything in the game telling me that was a thing, that it right. had to go back to the same city that you built it in. Yeah, you gotta figure that out from trial and error. It's not like the game is well known for being good at <laughs> explaining its culture <laughs> yeah, victory. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the point of that is that they didn't want you to set up a situation where you would get dig up an artifact and then not have a place to put it and it would just disappear into the ether. I think that's what they were trying to avoid, but it still doesn't accomplish that because, as you said, you can still just trade for it and Unlike in Civ Five, you can trade great works for other things besides great works. Whereas Civ Five had a whole UI that was just for great work trading, and you could only trade one great work for one other great work, if I remember correctly. Something like that. Whereas in in Civ Six, you can buy it for gold or now diplomatic favor or luxuries or something like that, which means you can acquire more great works than you had the people to create them originally. Which means you can end up in situations where you have a great artist or archaeologist who creates something and there's literally not empty place for you to put it. And in that case, I'm pretty sure it just disappears into the ether. I might check that. I don't know if you can actually trade for slots that are reserved by an archaeologist, but I do not know, so I will check that at some point. Maybe not. I, I do know that if writers and artists and musicians, if there's not an available slot, you cannot use the action to create the great work. Correct. Uh, but I have not seen a similar restriction for archaeologists, so maybe they did put something in and I just haven't seen it. But anyway, with this topic, people go on to talk about appeal and how that doesn't do anything for 90% of the game, unless you're Congo, in which case you can build those early neighborhoods. But I think those early neighborhoods aren't actually affected by appeal, so it's moot anyway. Canada. Well, yeah, in Australia, because you get the, the appeal bonuses and you can put yes. holy sites in science district. Dang it. I can't think of the name Campus. for some reason. Campuses. Yeah, the campus. Yes, yeah. But you can stick them out in very nice looking places and they get a huge, nice bonus. And that's a lot because you can do yes. that so early. And then another response is that specialists, specialists. should do more. Specialists, specialists should do more. should exist as an entity in the game other than just an extra person who can work a tile. Yep. Yeah, I don't even think they give you great people points, do they? No, they don't. It's, it's like two yield. They it's... give you two yield of whatever your district is, and that's it, oh. which means that it is vastly inferior to almost all tiles. Right, especially considering that there are now so many tiles in the game that do provide a base yield of faith or culture or science. And if you're next to, like, a natural wonder, I mean, you're probably getting a lot more than any specialist would give you. Yeah, and if you go back to Civ Four, I mean, specialists created a whole different way to create a city. They were something that you would build a, build specialist cities around, you would plan for that, and, and you would make that happen now— they're just something that's there that, well, I guess if you ran out of spots for population to work, you'd probably use. Maybe in special cases you're going to use them. If you're trying to make money when there's no yield on the map and you have an, a culture right. district or a yeah. commercial district, that'll work. Also, yeah. if you want to boost your science or culture output. On a tangential note, does Civ Six have unemployed citizens? Because in, in previous games, if you did not have a tile for a citizen to work, or if you removed a citizen from a tile, they went into an unemployment pool 
and each of those citizens generated one production. But I have not seen a UI for that in Civ 6, so I have no idea if Civ 6 will let you unassign a citizen, and if so, where does that citizen go, and does that citizen produce anything? That is a good question. I have never seen that either. I don't yeah, think I've never... I've run, run myself over like that. I've never... Well, you don't even have to necessarily run yourself over. Like, you could just... In, in Civ 5 and Civ 4, you could just unassign the citizen from working a tile, and it went into that unemployment pool. So, you know, you could do it with just one citizen, and it would be a way of getting extra production if you needed right. to, like, rush something, and you couldn't get you the know, production use any other way. Right, it was, yeah. like one, it was like one production, but if that's the difference in a turn, then who cares that it's only one production? In right. Civ 5, it would actually take units off of tiles to give you production if that was the best option. Right, the so if you've got would. a city in Civ 4 and Civ 5 that just has nothing but farms and grassland and you have no forests and no hills but you have a lot of food and you can support a bunch of unemployed citizens without starving your city then yeah that would be a way of getting some production but i have no idea if civ 6 supports that because i've never actually risked not getting the production for a few turns to test it that sounds like a research topic yeah maybe i'll do that as homework this week make a blog post (laughs) maybe later from rosen rage then i don't know how to pronounce that why doesn't tourism provide money that also is a very good point because if it did it would be overpowered. Yeah, I mean, I live in Las Vegas, so <laughs> the idea of tourism not generating money is completely foreign and weird to me. I have the same issue in, in other games like City Skylines. Why isn't tourism considered an industry and treated as such? Because I live in Las Vegas, and that is our industry. In the game, though, tourism is not a means to get other resources. Tourism is a resource. Right. And, and I think there's a big difference there. You aren't getting other resources resources you aren't getting one resource from another resource you're gonna you can use some resources to buy different things but you can't have tourism buy money because money is also a resource so as long as they want that separate then that needs to be a separate thing i agree with that i think the issue is that you can't do anything with tourism in the game. You know, like Faith, you can buy great people in units, you know, gold, you buy things, you you spend everything else. You don't spend tourism, you just accumulate it towards the culture victory. I was going to say, there is one very big thing you can do with tourism, and that's win the game. Well, that's right, but you can also do that with every other (laughs) resource effectively, so... Unless you build Big Ben, then you have negative money. money. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I could see tourism having effects like maybe boosting your population growth because it's also bringing in more immigration to the city. I could see it having other indirect effects like that. It doesn't necessarily have to generate money or wealth or production, but it could boost city growth or provide uh, maybe diplomatic bonuses if you're getting a lot of tourism from another civ, like they're going to be friendlier towards you. It could do things like that. I do agree there, but it has to be that it can be spent towards things that you can normally spend resources towards. Yeah. I mean, it could be something that's totally different is totally unrelated, but you can't spend it to get another resource. I could also maybe see tourism being an alternate yield for building naturalists and rock bands. But then again, the issue with that is you don't accumulate tourism. It's just you are generating so much per turn. So there's not one bucket of this is how many tourism you've generated through the game. So mechanically, that doesn't work with the way Civ 6 is currently implementing it. Culture is weird. And we don't not understand it very well. That's been a long-running complaint, is that tourism mechanics are difficult to understand. Well, it's frustrating, because in Civ Five, I thought they worked very well, and it was relatively easy to understand. And since it's not an accumulated resource, you know, just to use, like, your Rock Band example, the more tourism you have, the stronger your Rock Band is. You know, the, the... This is really the first Civ game where it has been, so uh, obscure. Yeah. Wow. Even when Civ 3 introduced it, it was still, like, the, the information was documented. You could just look, either look in the manual or even look in the game and you'd get what you need. Yeah, I think in Civ 3, tourism did directly convert to gold. Like, when a wonder or something became obsolete, it became a tourist attraction and just generated an increasing number of gold based on how old the wonder was. Yeah, well, I mean, the way victory was decided was different. Like, you weren't overpowering other people's culture using tourism. Yeah. That wasn't even in Civ 4 yet. Even in Civ right. 4, you just needed three legendary cities. And it wasn't even awesome multi use culture to get that. <laughs> right. And again, that wasn't tourism. That was culture. It was just culture. So it was a different yield. The tourism is a completely separate yield from culture in a. It, it's, in still a, um, it's still called a culture victory, though, now. Yeah. Even though you don't actually need culture yield in order to uh, achieve it.
the features that are missing that were in Civ 4. Vasir posted, two lovely features from Civ 4 still missing. Why? Sorry to dig this up after a second ex- expansion. I can't help but wonder about two of my favorite features from Civ 4 still not being resurrected. Vassalage, remember how much fun it was? To get revenge on a longtime rival by not killing him off completely, but making him your puppet for the rest of the game, using him as a buffer zone, etc. Do you also remember how much fun it was to have Mansa Musa vas- peace vassal to Shaka when you're about ready to go to war with them. That was I remember how much fun that was. That, that, that was a lot of Door <laughs> Fortress fun right there. Mm-hmm. And Emerging Nations. I loved it when you got to crack the rival Civ in half, and then there was three three Chinese cities all of a sudden proclaiming themselves to be Maya and declaring independence. Well, that was for that was for historical accuracy. Because I you don't know, think that was in Civ Four Vanilla. I played a little bit of Civ Four Vanilla, just just a smidge of it. It was and, in Vanilla. I think it was in Vassalage and the Emerging Nations. I think were both in the Warlords expansion. I, I, well, I played BTS for like years. Vassalage like, all the way through. Is he what? talking about culture flipping? No, what he's talking no. about is you settle a bunch of cities on a foreign landmass and then let them free as a colony. But that's not like an emerging well, nation. You're not cracking a rival in half. That's no, something that, that you I elect think that could to happen do. Too. I think if you if you conquered another Civ's capital, there was a chance mm-hmm. that their Civ might not split Civ into four. multiple That was Civ, Civ 2. Yeah, was that, yeah, that was not a Civ 4 two. thing. Yeah, that was way back. Mm. Yeah, that was back before. Yeah, that I was wasn't even... really a thing. I don't know. I could have swore I remember that happening in Civ Four as well. So there was a mod for it, but yeah, yeah, Maybe. not in Vanilla or any of the expansions. I do miss uh, War Vassals, and they would definitely <laughs> shorten games in Civ yeah. Six that are needlessly long right now. So that would be nice. Peace Vassals can die in a fire yes. until they actually <laughs> fix the game incentives. That shouldn't be in the game. Yes. I think my favorite missing feature from Civ Four is actually it. I think it was the conquest or domination. No, it was the domination victory where you just had to have like sixty percent of the world's population and land area. You did not have to actually conquer everybody. Right and what there. I liked about it was that you could accomplish that through empire building and not through any one like specific strategy it was just build and expand your empire organically until you control the majority of the world's population and land area right. and you could do that through conquest you could do it through settling you could do it through vassalage you could do it through you know permanent alliances i you're love probably how probably not going to do it without war on anything above like the low difficulty tiers you're not going right, to get it but it, settling. it wasn't it wasn't that you know very strict rigid requirement where you have to take their capital or else the war was like uh. Completely pointless. It was but, you could take yeah. a few cities from one sieve and then a few cities from another sieve and and so on and just build your block and just increase it until you are just dominating the world. Yeah. One, one of the most fun games I played in Civ 4 was just it was just doing something silly, but I played it with only dom- domination victory was the only um, victory option and it was all peace. And so the whole goal was to culture flip 60% of the world. Oh, God, I did that once, too. Oh, it was yeah. actually a challenge on the forum. It was a blast. Yeah. I had I had a great time with it. And I would bring up the, the culture flipping as something that disappeared that I wanted back. But we do have loyalty now, which is kind of bringing it back. Yeah, I think um, it, loyalty is a better mechanic than how culture flipping works. I, 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 and there's I think a serious it is too. barrier to getting that to work in Civ 4. And that is if you stacked enough units, roughly 20, into a city, it was impossible the flip no matter what it would oh, never go units, into revolt did units the, somehow oh it was because they yeah they quelled the revolt they would okay. block revolt and you needed the revolt to you needed two revolts the first revolt would like just put them in revolt for a while the second revolt would flip the city unless it had previously been, been conquered by the uh city that was uh, by the city that just took it i don't so, think that it, it was a revolt great a mechanic but it was a very fun mechanic to toy with to, oh yeah to, Get rid of that stupid city that the AI settled, or do it just because. I, that it, it was just a lot of fun to deal deal with that and watch watch somebody's culture go, going away on them. And so, espionage was the way to go there because you could spread the culture yep. with the espionage oh, yeah. mission, and oh man, that would <laughs> you could stack up a lot of culture quickly. Oh, yeah. I had fun with their espionage. That's actually uh, how people got the world record culture times. Eventually, it was using espionage. But yeah, so so features from Civ Four that are still missing that I miss is I am lazy and therefore I want my automated workers back and I want my workers to be able to be building roads from the start. I, I want to be able to put the roads where I want my roads and I want them to be my, my builders to be automated. I know they're going to go waste charges on things I don't want. Hopefully I can shut off their ability to chop my trees, but that's what I really want. Yeah, back. I'd be wary about builder automation because of the charges. But yeah. you wouldn't have to turn on and I could. Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm always in support of the game having more options for the player to take 
tailor the experience to what, whatever they're comfortable with. If I had it, I would not be against dedicating a city to building builders for me and just keep uh, pumping out builders and let them go out and do their thing. Yeah, you have a queue now, so you could just queue up a bunch of them. I think the queue only lets you do like, what, like six or eight If things. only you could set it to loop produce. Yeah, that would be yeah. nice. Speaking yeah. of features missing from Civ 4, how about competent UI? That was That's a feature from Civ 4. Another but, little but UI Civ feature. Civ 4 didn't really have a competent UI. It just had a better UI than Civ 6. It, it had a passable UI, I should say. Not com- Well, it was mostly competent. There were yeah, some I, issues with it, but right, I, I would say it was a good UI, but I would say it was functional. I didn't play Civ 4 at a high enough level to, to really know, but I my memory of it is that it was a very effective UI. I would never had any, I think, major complaints with how Civ 4's UI was laid out. How about there were using... some inaccuracies in terms of the information presented, and that's not good so that's that's a knock i would give it for sure what about when you use the shift key and right click sometimes it would just deselect everything yeah yeah and there was some there were some selection issues and there's sometimes where the game would think you're pressing alt when you're not which could cause problems that's weird Uh, yeah far from perfect but so so much better than any of its uh, successors that it's hard to believe that firaxis has made the better ui earlier like why regress it so badly it was also a simpler game so you know that might but i'm not talking about complex things here i'm talking about things like unit selection moving picking what you're going to build in a city these are all things that are functionally identical and mechanic uh, yeah i I really miss the drag and drop build queue that was in civ 4 that was so easy to use you could just click on the city and click on the unit at the bottom like it was two inputs and if you held a key then you could loop or uh, queue up without like any special extras you just hold control and click and you bring something to the top of the queue you hold shift and click and you move it to the bottom of the queue you want to yeah. only give multiple city build orders at once you can you want to be you want to sort by yields to give those orders fall from the same screen you can but the, that i definitely missed this from uh so far because it saved so much time it saved yeah. hours literally because I, I used to record footage of it and my games back then were hours less than they are now yeah even if i'm playing with fewer civs on the map and i call it being lazy but really it's that i just don't want to be have to focus on those things there's more more fun things in the game for me to be focusing on than trying to navigate through the ui yeah you want to get up to the the more fun big scale things like the wars instead of the micro scale of oh how do i need to develop this again when i click on a city show me all the information on the city you guys put it on two sides of the screen anyway why don't you just show it all to me (laughs) yeah there's a lot of information in that city view if you just know how to find it it's just not very easily findable in some ways that's too much information yeah another little ui thing that i missed from civ 4 was the drawing layer which is something that you know a lot of people probably don't even know existed <laughs> but civ 4, had, civ 4 had this thing it was a little button next to the map where you could enter i don't remember what they called it but it was like civ 6 has the the pins that you can put on the map but in civ 4 had that as well you could put little pins and labels on the map but it also had a thing where you could just with the mouse just freehand draw like lines and stuff like that on the mm-hmm. map and it was really great i would plan out all my cities from the start of the game i'd circle i want a city here and I'd like draw little arrows i'm gonna move my stack of doom like through this territory and to this city and conquer it and it was a lot of fun to play around with and i think you could also share it with other players on your team if you wanted to <laughs> so you could yes. like coordinate military plans and stuff like that and it hasn't come back since Civ 4 and i miss it but don't do it you... play by email because if you do your enemy can see it if you're fighting another team <laughs> in, uh, you want them to you're see it the... you want to throw some trash the drawing, oh, yeah. yeah. In Civ 4? In, in yeah. Civ 4, if, you're, if you draw on the map, every player can see it. So if it's a human player, they will be able to see it, even if they're on a different team. Oh, I thought you could hide it from different teams. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think uh, you can hide it and point? hope nobody notices it's there. I used okay. it a little bit, but I used the bug and bull mod more for city placement because it would show you where your border expansion was. And it was really uh, easy to just look at and see how it, see how it goes. <laughs> you could be really annoying with that, though, the, with putting crap on other people's maps that they don't want to see, but they can't get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there was a hide option back then. Yeah, I missed the end game replay. Oh, yeah, that was nice, too. Didn't the Civ 6 Hall of Fame bring that back? I don't know um, if it did. I know Civ 5 original, eventually added it. Yeah, Civ 5 brought it back. I don't know that Civ 6 has. Like, when I win the game, I'm usually just like, oh, good, it's over. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, Next unfortunately. Game. 
Which, again, is why I really missed that domination victory from Civ 4, because that allowed games to end a lot earlier. Well, in my case, it's mostly I'm playing on a difficulty that's probably too easy for me, because I've won the game by the industrial era, and I just finish in the future era, and just like, okay. Yeah, you just gotta go through that hours-long process of formalizing the victory and getting to that end screen. Well, it doesn't really take an hour, usually. It's just, I get tired of it if I am bored. Right. Sometimes I just like screwing around and blowing things up. I have a little bit of, of an enjoyment, the little bit of nostalgia that you get out of stuff like that, because I kind of think back to my game, and I don't just think back to it on pure strategy. I think back to my empire growth. I like my empire growth. I enjoyed building this empire, and then I can watch that, and I can say, hey, yeah, this this is where I had this thing happen, and roll my eyes at the spot where the AI did something stupid and just set me back a ridiculous amount because I decided that I couldn't let him settle this stupid city on this island, <laughs> or something, weird, weird little things like that. So that's that's where I miss it, because I think for me, there's a little bit more enjoyment in that. Of course, I'm still mostly a strategy player, but I do like to think of my empire overall as well. Yeah, there was an almost role play kind of element to it. Yeah, but I, I get scared when people say role play because I really don't get into it that far. I get into if I'm role playing building an empire. Yes. If I'm role playing what each individual person's doing or something. No, 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 no. I, I, I can't go that right. far. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. It, <sighs> it, it, it felt more like building an empire and less yeah. like like just playing a board game. Yes. Yeah. When they brought the queue system back in Civ 6, I haven't seen this yet, but is it does it have the templates for cities where you could just have save the row of builds and then when you open your new city you can just hit I that? Don't. No. I highly just, doubt it. That was I'm, so I'm, nice in Civ 4 later in the game I'm when you're, you're just settling sure all those junk cities. I'm pretty sure that's Civ 4 exclusive. It's also nice in Civ 4 when you're conquering a bunch at the end. And you just want to yeah. queue up some stuff so that the city yeah. builds the stuff that's good for all cities. Yeah, so it doesn't placement. die. Yeah. District placement would make that a very difficult thing to implement in Civ Six. Well, you wouldn't have to queue in district placement. Even if you did, though, you could just have it, like, prompt you. No. Well, but in that case, like, the only things that would be queuable would be the monument, granary, and water mill. Yeah, the cities that I'm worried about, I don't even think that I would care too much about districts. Just give me something else. Let me do the other ones and then, yeah, you know, it, projects for the rest of the game. It would be kind of <laughs> nice if the, if the cities did just give you the option to automate the city and the city would just put the districts oh. wherever it, it would get the highest adjacency bonus from them and yeah it would probably do a lot of stupid things yeah. because you know as we firmly established the ai is not very good at placing districts but it would eliminate a lot of the tedious micromanagement especially later in the game when you're just conquering cities or just founding a few cities just to get a resource you know what else i miss build wealth yes. build research for this reason because those things you could just put a city on it and it would stay on that until you take it off yeah, yeah. and i definitely if we could automate cities i'd definitely want that to be a city by city thing oh yes yes not a don't don't make don't make that something that we have to turn on it's on or it's off we definitely want that to be city by city because it's the junk cities that we're taking along the way or the ones we just don't care about that we want to let you guys control exactly that's what i meant i think somebody in the thread even mentioned mentioned missing puppets and and not having to do it i think that is in this thread somewhere the puppets from civ 5 yes i know it's not a civ 4 feature but somebody else mentioned that but it was for this exact same reason it was when you're on that conquest role i don't have to deal with it well so far lets you get do that effect though because you could automate a city build if you right, wanted right. not just build wealth but you could tell you could automate what to construct you could tell the, the governor to do that it was bad but if you didn't care about the city then you didn't care that it was bad so and that was and, still there and usually 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 the governor before long ended up building wealth or building science anyway he would build nearly every building first though which is suboptimal by a wide margin but eh, it's whatever if you don't care about the city and you're just wrapping up a domination yeah. victory just turn that crap on and never get prompted again you're fine yeah exactly. Exactly. And worst case scenario, you know, if something comes up, you just go to that city and you just insert something into the queue. Yeah. Yep. You know, if you need a unit or something real quick. Oh, sure. And you can even control click it in so that it would go right back to building wealth. When you're done. Yep. A lot yep. of them, I'd queue a bunch of things up and then I would just queue wealth at the end, make that the last thing or queue science at the end. And then as I'm looking around the empire, if I see one on it and I think that I want something that I would go use it. Basically, it's like the queue that's saying, hey, I'm here. If you need something, come see me. I can see a quick glance on the map. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's also so we're talking about the things that are neglected, but they've also brought some things back that I was really happy to see back. The other thing that I'm happy to see back is non-global happiness. 
I like that my cities I can spread and not have to worry about, oh, sorry, you just sent your entire empire into doing absolutely nothing because you built one extra city or you took one extra city that happened to have too much population. Yes, uh, that yeah. got a little ridiculous. I'm yeah, also that really got old pretty fast. I'm also really liking the new strategic resource supply mechanic. In, in fact, I think I might even like it more than how Civ Five implemented it. I like it and I don't. I feel like they don't give you enough quick enough, so oh. you end up really having to wait too long to be able to do things. By the time I can upgrade my units or build the units I need with one resource, I'm usually ready for the next level. Yeah, I do have some complaints with with how the the resources are accumulated and with what units require what resources. I really think that knights should require horses. You know, I I don't know why they couldn't make it 10 iron and 10 horses. But yeah, I have little complaints like that. But just in general, the idea of accumulating the resources and being able to trade them in lump sums and the fact that I'm actually using pikemen now because of strategic resource limitations. So it made other units more useful. There's just a lot of things that the strategic resource supply, I think, did that improved Civ 6 a lot. I guess. I don't like the early iron shortages, though. But other than that, it's not a big deal. Well, Stan said on the, on the forums is apparently not played in a while and wants a rundown on like everything in Gathering Storm. It's mean, like, what things have changed when it comes to, wait, SV? What is SV? Science Victory. Okay, thank you. Because my brain completely blanked when I saw that. What text? It's a pseudo victory condition, but <laughs> it, it, that's too long to type out, so they just type SV. Yeah, tech tree path optimal. Civic tree path is optimal. What district should I focus on? Well, Science. I mean, I thought that one was a given. <laughs> Are there any must-have great people or wonders? So basically, give me a rundown on the difference between Science Victory before this expansion and and in this expansion, more or less. <laughs> Just got other questions in here. Like, apparently, there are two projects to speed up the Exoplanet Expedition, but that's hard to say in a row exoplanet expedition ah but the future era where those are in is randomized if i think right so yes, yes. Y- you can't guarantee that usually it takes longer to get the ship to the mo- to the next planet than it does to finish the tech tree though because usually if you're doing a science victory you can finish the tech tree almost faster than you can produce the exoplanet expedition yeah you're gonna speed through the rest of that and still be going waiting on this and going oh wait You know, it's going to take you longer to build up your infrastructure to build the silly thing and get it sent. And in the meantime, you're going to finish the tech tree and you're like, so why didn't I win already? I mean, 50 light years is pretty, I I don't know, aka turns. Yeah. Wasn't it only 30 in previous ones? 30 to reach the planet? Yeah, I think so. I think the only other time we had one where you actually had to reach the planet was Civ 4 in that in Beyond the Sword, and I think that was 20 turns? It depended on game speed and the number of parts you built for engines and thrusters. Right. Um, yeah. If you built absolutely everything on standard speed, it was 10 turns, but because the second engine was rarely worth building unless you had so much production you could concurrently produce them at the same speed, it was usually 12 turns. There was a similar mechanic in Beyond Earth with certain things you would build, and then 30 turns later you'd win. Looking at you, Mind Flower. But it looks like here it says that there are science victory, peaceful science victory of wins without pillaging before turn 150. Yeah, somebody's got their list, or, so, other, or somebody put up what the record was was in a Chinese in the Chinese forums. It was turn 134. So if you read up on that though, the people have they're using maps that they know. They've pre-plotted out everything they're planning on doing. They followed it. They save and load when they, when needed, and they're doing all the things to make sure that they can do it just perfectly. Yeah, this would not be game of the month viable, basically. Right. Still, I mean, if you can do it in one, at 134 and you're that good and you can figure out a strategy to do that, you can probably still do it in a really good time. Yeah, people are just trying to go for the oh, record. For sure. and... These are very good players doing this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they would lose some time on a random map without optimal conditions, but they would still have very good finish times, even so. Yeah, assuming, assuming they're still allowed to save and reload and stuff. Even without that, the people who actually get the highest stuff, they're yeah. extremely good. Yeah. They, they could play without save reload. Like, they, they, like, all this costs a little bit of time if you can't do it versus can, but they still wouldn't have any problems. 
So are we uh, moving on then, I guess? I guess. There doesn't seem to be a lot of information in this thread now that I'm reading it a second time. We don't have to like have a huge dump on every thread. Well, I mean, I think the real thing here, though, was the person's looking for common information, and they ended up getting some super strategy that they're probably not going to be able to implement. <laughs> If, if you were to talk normal terms uh, the re- that the rest of us understand, districts to focus on, you know, focus on focus on your science districts, get that up, get your money up. That would be yeah, my, strat- commerce, my strategy. Yes. I, I need to get lots of money going. I want my commerce because I want trade route. Get your science up. You're going to want your culture up. I tend to not be as good at culture as a lot of other people. I don't get my theater districts up. That's not a district that I usually get up until late. But different different people doing different things. Then there's also Magna, Magnus and Pingala. Pingala yes. has the flat plus one science and plus one culture per pop in a city. And then there's some governor that lets you buy districts in the late game. Is there is that Rena? The religion one. The religious one. You can buy them for religion. Well, I know you, oh, there's one where that. you can buy them by faith, but there's also one where you can buy them by gold. And I think mm, that's I, Rena. I haven't seen that. I think you're right. If it's going to be someone, that would be the one I would guess. Yeah. And then Magnus is the one that lets you pile on workers to increase worker projects. Yeah, it's Reina's uh, contractor promotion. But anyway, what were we talking about? We, we just finished science the victories. science victory. Now it's time to talk about settling lots of cities. Yay. Or maybe it depends when you're settling lots of cities, or even if you're settling them versus acquiring them through other means. This one started by Brutus too. The, the general question of the thread is how many settlers do you build pre-government plaza? And so he was looking for eight to ten cities by turn one hundred as a general thumb, but we've been on autopilot. So. It, basically, because the government plaza gives you access to stuff more efficiently, it's a question of how many you build early versus later. And for me, that really depends on situation. I, I get rushed often on deity, and there's not that many cities to settle. But this might be a more of a consideration below that, where there's actually land to settle before the AI like jumps you with military units and then throws cities behind it, and then you wind up just taking cities normally. Because you just don't have to build that many settlers on when the map gets crowded quickly. When I do but, it, I usually build as many settlers as I can until they start costing too long and then i build up the hut when i need it i'm kind of the same way it's like why do i want to wait i mean maybe getting it to use it sure but do i really want to wait for it no because i want to get those other cities going each city is going to give me more science more culture more everything and it's going to start growing a little bit faster the qu- the question is your trade-off of resources and time i'm going to save resources by having it but do those resources outdo what i get so let's say that it saves me one turn at the end of the game that city that I placed, is the resources from one turn there going to be better than the resources that it cost me that I lost waiting for it earlier? And I don't think that's worth worth the wait. I, I feel like I want to get my cities down. And hey, building that along with it, sure, but I'm not going to wait for it. The other consideration I see with that is the land grab. And the city spot might not be available, so now you might be investing in a swordsman or something in order if, if, you, want, if you want to go deal with them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you true. want that city. So those are the two considerations that I see with it. The land grab is situational, of course. So is this another one of those it depends topics? I would say so, yeah. I don't think so so much. I think that the idea that I should wait for it is to me would be a no. But the idea that I, sh- I could use it if I'm going to be building a lot of settlers, heck yeah. It might also be depending on how much other stuff you need to build to be viable before you can get to the government district. Because yeah. you have to build the district, too, and that's not yep. cheap. Yep. And you have to wait for it. Really rather have that first three or four cities, especially in the multiplayer game, instead of waiting for the district and being able to build it and then get yep. the discount. My current plan, I usually don't get to that district for quite a while either because I have other things that I want to get done. I know I should, but I usually don't speaking of filling things up yes let's talk about filling up the unit upgrade trees a little bit more there was another thread posted on Civ Fanatics by Raj Zen K-R-A-J-Z-E-N I think it's Kryzen, yeah, okay. but I don't know for sure. The I... thread is titled, How Would You Change Current Base Unit Upgrade Trees? And the post asks, if you could change them, what would you do? For me personally, this being the uh, original poster, the unit upgrade trees are really good, much better than Civ Five and its infamous anti-cavalry unit line. <laughs> Ugh. 
<laughs> yeah, traumatic memories resurfacing. This person says that the only unit that really bothers them is, I guess, the lack of a rifleman between musclemen <laughs> and infantry. And yeah, that is a, a pretty big problem. Yeah. I would also throw in, calling back to a topic earlier, I think we should have a medieval infantry and a medieval siege unit to counter those medieval walls. Maybe that some come medieval up. boats. Yes, yeah. I would also very much like some medieval boats. I posted a topic a couple weeks ago about privateers in which I mentioned that I would really like to have a medieval raider unit available in general like a a courser that the Ottomans get, but for everybody. And maybe even a land-based raider unit, like a bandit or a mercenary, or, you know, maybe the Landschnecht, however you pronounce that. Hand uh, axes. Could be a, yeah, could be (laughs) a good hand axe. Oh, no, they might actually not be crappy. I am very happy that Gathering Storm filled out some of the most egregious gaps in the unit tree. The skirmisher is a excellent addition. Like having to go from a scout all the way to a ranger was like absolutely ridiculous. And it's really nice to have a mid game exploration unit again for like when you get your caravels out and you can actually explore another continent you could actually use your reconnaissance units to do that instead of having to use like a knight or something and then the mounted unit lines are also filled out so the courser and the cuirassier i'm also not sure how to pronounce that i think those are really good additions that fill out the mounted unit line that was that had a lot of big gaps in it so for me right now i think the only big gaps are the the lack of a medieval infantry a medieval siege and a rifleman and some medieval naval units i'm looking at the unit tree in the civ wiki and it looks like the only one that has a gap of more than one area is the galley because it comes in ancient and isn't upgraded till the caravel and the renaissance era and the giant death robot which doesn't have any for the first seven eras isn't the quadrium also quadrium is a naval ranged and it's in classical yes Oh, we need the... we need smaller death robots earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I personally am an advocate that there should be a unit upgrade for pretty much every unit class in every era. Because I think one of the big issues that I have with combat in general in Civ Six is that having an upgraded unit is such an overwhelming advantage. And I really wish that there were more intermediary units to make that advantage less extreme. If you could make the advantage less extreme, I think that would be a good thing because that kind of hits on what my big question with this type of this type of change is that no matter what speed I play on in the game, it takes me just as long to walk to the next city. Yep. And by the time I get there on a fast speed, they've upgraded. On a slow slower speed, sure, yeah, we can we can actually fight in the era. And I kind of like one thing in in Civ Four. Going back to our Civ Four things that we miss, uh, <laughs> I miss playing on epic speed there because the turns in between weren't too bad, and I could actually have a good war with Macemen. You know, I can have a war in that era. I didn't have to have a war start in ancient times and end with rifle. I could do that, but I didn't have to. And now it, it seems like you're constantly looking to upgrade and everything is based on the whole war it ends up being based on your ability to either produce the units at the start, produce the newer units at the start, I should say, and make the war very fast. Or how, how much infrastructure do you have to upgrade pretty much every time you're taking a city and moving on. And so if you have more units and they have big differences between them, that becomes a problem. If you have more units, but they can they can reasonably fight each other, then, well, maybe that's not so bad. I really wish that Civ 6 uh, and also Civ 5 had a game speed where the first half of the game is paced akin to epic and the second half of the game is paced akin to normal. Oh, yeah. That would be yeah. nice. That the early game takes a little longer. There's more turn in the early game and then the later game is not so many turns that would be nice another thing that comes into play on that is the resource use and how the resources work right now because a lot of these units you're changing the resource along the way and sometimes you're going into where you now have to pay upkeep on some of them some of the later ones and that to oh, me yeah. kind of figures in too because if you're going to add more units you can't make me pay full price for all my upgrades along the way and give me a ton more options unless you're going to increase the yields of the resources which would be a possibility since that is what it's being used for it also makes professional armies uh, policy a lot more valuable. You'd probably be always running yeah. that. Yeah, and I really don't like situations where something like a policy is you always do it. I, th- I think it's yeah. much better when you have reasonable choices. I mean, I, I know I end up playing a lot of times the same way anyway, but still there are other reasonable options, and I do like that. 
or alternatively, you're, you would be building more units that do not require resources so that you can upgrade them in a more timely fashion while you wait for your resource-dependent ones to be able to be upgraded. Yep. So again, maybe maybe pikemen would become more useful. Yeah, kind of like how you can build horsemen with, with your horses while building some, and then as you're starting that war, build some chariots that you're going to upgrade to knights to be your next war. You know, you, you can do some leapfrogging as long as you got them on, as long as they're on different resources. Call in today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows are about Polycast in general, Log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. Well, this has been Polycast episode 334. Oh, with me today, Candace Albinus. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I startled him. He's like, wait, I'm first. What? A Mega Bears fan? And me and Jane? Another military unit? Another optimized, efficient game. And guess this week's Sush. Are we still calling it Title Goes Here, or are we going to come up with a better name? We'll come up with a better name. Yes. <laughs> but Title Goes Here is great. <laughs> yes. Next time, I'll just leave underscores. <laughs> the title. <laughs> and welcome to Polycast <laughs> episode <laughs> underscore, underscore, underscore. I mean, that would make the listeners want to listen to the show for certain. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's excellent radio. Record date, March 23rd, 2019. Civilization 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6, Sound Clips, copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright The Polycast at thepolycast.net.